because it's slowed down a lot. So let's start with some announcements because there's a bunch tonight. And then we'll get into the presentation and member slides. Um, for those who didn't notice, I changed the link for all of our meetings. So you can save the one link and use the same one every month to get into our monthly meetings. So hopefully streamline the process for you. Um, it will definitely be in the next e-news that goes out with next month's uh, list, but it will be the same as tonight's. Um, next, Alaska Wild is currently at Side Street Espresso. We had a uh, first Friday last Friday and four people showed up. Thank you, COVID and snow. <laughs> so we, we closed it down early, but the people who came in loved it and were voting and sold nine books so far from the last two places. Um, so it's there through December 26th. So if you haven't seen the show yet, stop by Side Street Espresso, 412 G Street. Say hi to George and Deb, get a coffee and vote for your favorites. We need, we need uh, our People's Choice Award for next year. We need, voting's down this year because we've lost so many months. Um, so it's there through December 26th. And after that, it's going to Summit Spice and Tea in Midtown. Um, and then Jen Corbel and Gail, sorry, I'm flaking on names, have stepped up and are joining me to help run Alaska Wild. Yay, so it will continue to run. We met last night and we laid out the dates for submissions and everything. We're in the process of changing the submission rules. Uh, we'll have a big update for everybody next month and just know that we plan to open for submissions December 15th. So start looking through your images, um, be ready for that at least. December 15th through January 20th will be the submission period. Um, so we'll have lots more information next month. Um, also next month, our board elections, our annual elections, we have a minimum of three spots available on the board. There might be a fourth. Um, if anybody's interested, I've only had one person step forward and express interest. Our, we meet the first Wednesday of each month. Um, right now it's on Zoom from six to seven-ish. Um, pretty easy meetings, get, a, get stuff done. Um, we could use some new perspectives, especially business members. We'd love to have business members on there. Um, so let me know, send me an email if you're interested in that. We'd love to have you join us. And then the last big announcement I have is a personal one. I am scheduled for spinal fusion surgery next month. So Kathy's gonna take over running a whole bunch of things for me while I'm recovering. And we're starting that now so that she's up to speed and ready to go. So she's taking over the news the weekly e-news blast. Um, we worked on the last one together. She's gonna spearhead the next ones and then I've got time to help her as things change. So if you've got announcements you wanna post, start. you can start sending them to her. Um, she'll be running the Zoom meetings as well if I can't. Um, and once I can, I'll come back on and keep things going. And finally, um, Gary is here from Hunt's Photo and Video. Welcome Gary, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to let you know, I haven't made this announcement yet. Um, we are working with Hunts. They've been a business partner. They've supported us in the past and you've seen their deals and they work with us in shipping. Um, we're taking a step further this year and we're starting a 5% back to ASONP. So if you buy gear that you can't buy in, in Anchorage, um, you're welcome to go to Stewart's. We're not trying to take business from Stewart's. If you go, if you can't get it there or don't want to go there, you can go to Hunts. They will work with you directly. Um, and 5% of your purchase will come back to ASLMP and we're gonna put that money towards programming for everybody. Um, so you can help the organization get great deals, great customer service. They've helped me with orders. I know Kathy's ordered from a lot. Um, and we will be putting a link on the webpage, the ASLMP.org webpage for you to place orders in the, in the near future. Still working on the, and Gary wanted to introduce himself and become part of the group and, Say hi. Uh, so go ahead. <laughs> all right. Um, so um, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, it's eleven o'clock here, my time, but um, I felt, but I, I, I felt, um, I felt um, a privilege to try on and get on and, and meet you guys and meet the members. I know there's there's several members in your group that have ordered from me, and there's a lot of people that know Hunt's photo, but just 
for one reason have never one reason or the, or the other have never given given me the opportunity of the business. Um, a little bit about Hunt's Bottle. Hunt's Bottle is a company based in Massachusetts. Um, we're a family-owned business. We've we've been around for 25 years. Um, really, there's a lot of places that you that you want to buy stuff, and I want to echo what I'm going to echo what um, what she said. I I I want you to continue. I want you to continue to buy from local camera store if they're good to you. And, and they take care of you. I want you to continue to provide and I'm not here to take away business from the local store. But if you can't get it from, from the local store, then instead of going to the places that you normally go to, I'd like I'd like you i like you to I like it to be either local or or, or through Hunt's photo. Um, for me and what I do, I'm all about um, relationships, 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 relationships. Um, I don't want you to view me as just another um, just another retailer out there, just another guy trying to sell you sell you something. And whether I make a ten dollar a ten dollar sale or a thousand dollar sale, I want you to be more as a friend, a partner, and a trusted source. Uh, I want to be there. I want you guys to be there for me. I'll be there for you, and and really build that friendship, relationship, and 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 and, and the bonding type thing. That's what I'm all about. Um, and as long as you guys support me, I'll do everything in my power and to to, to support you guys. Um, so that's pretty much all um, that I have to say. But I will drop my email down in the chat so you have it. And I look forward to um, this mutual long-term working um, relationship and, and, and benefit. Um, and everything we carry is USA warranty. I do no gray market and I'm a, I'm a straight shooter. So um, you support me, I support you. And, and um, I'm the most, and I try to be a, a trade shooter and, and tell the honest stuff and legitimate stuff that, that I can provide. So um, thank you for having us on and I look forward to doing more stuff together. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think this could work out well for all of us. Uh, had great turnaround and work with Gary um, and Noah. And actually, Noah was going to be our is going to be our speaker in December on mirrorless cameras. So something to look forward to. Um, okay, I think that's all I had for announcements. Did anybody else have anything? No. I have something, Kathy. Um, or sorry. Um, God, okay. I'm brain dead tonight. <laughs> um, um, so Alaska Photographic Center is having their um, meeting next Wednesday, November 18th via Zoom. And Hal Gage is going to show his um, glacial silt um, um, series. Um, the Zoom link is on the website akphotocenter.org and I will send it to Kathy to put out in the, the email blast for next week. I Thank just wanted, oh. Oh, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, I just wanted to throw out, I am the person that has some of the gear for sale in the newsletter right now. And if anybody's interested, um, I this next newsletter will have an update of what's still available. Um, however, contact me before, we need to work this out before um, Thanksgiving because I'm going to have to be out of town quite a bit coming up for a family. Thing. So um, if you're interested, let me know. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, let's get on to our presentation. Um, I ask that you mute yourself if you're not muted. Um, Lisa Hupp is here to speak with us on Alaska Wildlife Refuges. Um, if you have a question for her, feel free to post, post it in the chat box while she's speaking. Well, she and I will be watching that. Um, or if you really have to, um, you can interrupt while we're going. You don't have to save it till the end. Um, and I will hand it over to Lisa. All right, thanks so much. Um, I'm excited to uh, be here tonight and be able to, to meet you and um, share a little bit of my work with you. And uh, there are a few names here I recognize, but a lot more that I don't. Um, a little bit of background, I've lived in Kodiak, uh, Alaska for about 15 years and I just moved to Anchorage for work um, this last spring, which has been a real interesting time um, to switch locations. So um, I've known Marion for, gosh, Marion, maybe 15 years. So I think the whole time I lived in Kodiak, so it's so fun to see your face. 
Um, and I was really looking forward to getting to know more members of this uh, group. And then COVID happened and kind of my brain short circuited. And so um, I'm excited. I just joined tonight and I'll, um, I'll look forward to hopefully getting engaged with you all more and, and learning from you. I'm not a professional photographer at all, uh, but I do use photography and videography as part of my job. And so um, that's a little bit of what I'm gonna be showing tonight. And I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Uh, all right. And I'll bring up the chat so I can see if anybody has questions, feel free at any point. I do have a couple of fun trivia questions. Um, I know some of you have been out to Alaska refuges before, so. Um, I expect that people are gonna know lots of the answers here. All right, I'm gonna put my chat box over. All right, um, so tonight I'm going to be talking and sharing some photos um, from several different wildlife refuges in Alaska. So I titled this from Arctic to Atu. Um, and this is gonna be sort of a, a tour through some different stories that I've worked on. Uh, so I'm going to share just a little bit of uh, my background. I've got a background in outreach and communications. Um, so I'm now the communications coordinator for Alaska Wildlife Refuges, which are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there's 16 refuges in Alaska, and I'm curious, um, chat in if you have been to one or several of those refuges. I'd love to just get a, a sense of if you visited. I have the map up here um, on the screen. And then on this intro slide, I also wanted to do a plug for the Friends of Alaska National Wildlife Refuges. Um, they're a group that supports all 16 refuges in Alaska. They do great things. Um, they have volunteer opportunities. They have a weekly or a monthly meeting um, with different topics that revolve. They invite biologists to talk. Um, they give different, different insights into different refuges around Alaska. Um, and this was a presentation that I first put together for their membership meeting. Um, this spring. So I think there might be a few Friends members on here as well. If anybody from the Friends group is here and wanted to say a quick hello, um, feel free. I see a couple more messages. Hi, I'm on the Friends Outreach Committee and um, saw this show in the spring when Lisa came and showed it for the um, our membership meeting and it was terrific and I'm back to see it again. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, yes, and Friends is a wonderful way to get to know um, the refuges uh, for multiple reasons. Um, you can write letters to help support environmental causes as well as find lots of tips for travel and recreation opportunities too. So please come and join us. And there's a question here, how do you join? Just go to the website or is there something else? The website would be a perfect place to go to. Um, and I don't have it right at my fingertips. <laughs> um, oh, it's I have, like, it's I have right, it up on the screen. Yep, right it's right on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Thanks, and then we have membership meetings in October, November, none in January, uh, none in December because of the holidays, January, February, March and I think possibly April. So not every month, but um, there everyone is very, it's well done and excellent by um, typically staff from the refuge. Perfect, thank you so much. And I'm seeing a couple chats come in. Folks have said Kenai is there in their backyard and Gail has been to Kodiak, Kenai, Alaska Peninsula, Alaska Maritime and Basharaf refuges. Um, that is really amazing and awesome. And uh, Basharaf is on my, my wish list someday. I hope to get over there. Um, so I have not been to all 16 refuges. That would be quite a travel experience. Um, I've, I've been to just a few and so um, I worked for Kodiak Refuge for about 10 years. So that's the refuge I have the most familiarity with. Um, and then a few years ago, I started to uh, travel to some of the other refuges at the request of staff who were looking for help with specific stories. And so I really loved what Beth said at the beginning of the meeting that she's interested in kind of meshing her professional interests around policy with the power of photography to help tell stories. Um, and that is 
really how I've been able to bring in my, um, my personal interest in photography into my work because um, a lot of what I try and do in my work is connect people with the refuges of Alaska. And um, I think as we, as we all know, photographs are a really powerful way to do that. So I use both photography and videography um, to tell different stories. So this is really gonna be a mix of landscapes and people and um, and some wildlife as well. All right, um, I actually was gonna ask a trivia question, but I, I kind of already went too far. I was gonna ask, this is, the, um, this is the smallest refuge of all the 16 refuges, but it also has um, the world's largest, and I'll just leave a blank there if anybody wants to take a guess, world's largest what at Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. Yeah, seagrass bed, eelgrass. Um, so this is looking out over the Eisenbeck Lagoon, which is kind of at the, the heart of the refuge. Um, and this is the, the landscape right around the lagoon and you can kind of see the eelgrass beds just starting there. Um, and so I was out there for just a few days um, last fall to do a quick story. And so these are just a few shots from that trip. Um, of course, starting with the, the really famous eelgrass beds. Um, I did have a polarizer for this shot, so I was able to to get a glimpse under the water. Um, this was kind of a miraculous, I was kind of in between two major September storms and I don't know if anybody else has been out to, to Cold Bay before, but um, I kind of got in just by the skin of my teeth and I got out by the skin of my teeth. And, and then there was a six hour period where um, it stopped blowing 50 miles an hour and, and everything just laid flat. Um, and so I felt really lucky that I got to see the lagoon when it was this calm um, and then uh, of course, just a few hours later, it kicked up again. And then just another shot at the lagoon. Um, the lagoon, of course, is extra famous because it gets uh, pretty much the world's po entire population of Black Brant uh, migrating through at different periods of the year. And so I, when I was there, the, the Brant were just starting to come in, um, just a few flocks out on the, the lagoon. And I was there to tell a story um, about being able to travel to the refuge by ferry, which is kind of a unique way. Most of our refuges in Alaska are pretty remote. You, you usually have to take um, a small plane to reach a lot of our refuges, Kenai and Tetlin being the, the exception on the road system. Um, but Eisenbeck is one of our refuges where you can actually visit um, by ferry. And I'm curious, has anybody done this ferry trip? This is one of the first trips I ever did when I moved to Alaska, uh, when I went out to work in Dutch Harbor. Um, and I didn't know at the time that you could actually get off the ferry. There's a lottery. You can get off the ferry as it calls in Cold Bay and the refuge has uh, a tour bus and you can take a tour with refuge staff and they drive you out um, and you can actually visit Eisenbeck Lagoon um, before you get back on the ferry and, and go further up the chain. And Marion's been out there, that's great. Um, so if you do get a chance to go on the ferry, you can stop over. Uh, there is a small visitor center in Cold Bay and that is part of the refuge tour. So you can get a little bit of a sense of where you're at out there on the Alaska Peninsula. And it takes you out to uh, Grant Point, which is this overlook and you can get a, a view out over the lagoon. And I thought I saw it from somebody else's background photo. It almost looks like this volcano in the background. I'm curious if anybody had their, their background photo of, of this place as well. Um, and Bart, it looks like you guys went out there a couple years ago. So this was, this was mid-September, um, early September, and um, there were still a few wildflowers out. I felt kind of lucky to get this, this little tail end of summer. And I also got to meet a couple of, uh, of other critters around. And this again was that, that small window of time when uh, the weather wasn't terrible. And this red fox came in and was quite familiar and um, played around for a little while. So I got a few photos of her and she was loving the eelgrass beds. Um, so this is a, a kind of a pile of dried eelgrass on the, the edge of the lagoon and she would just roll around in it. and then she, I watched her bury, I think a, a tundra bowl into a little, um, a little pile of eelgrass and, and I'm sure she was caching it for later. Um, and she was really, just having a good time at the edge of the lagoon. All right. Uh, the other reason I was out in Eisenbeck was to um, uh, do a profile on a, a retiring pilot out there who, um, who 
who had flown for the refuge for several years and he was, this was gonna be his last year. So I was out doing, uh, doing some interviews with him. Uh, thanks, Marianne. Um, Marianne says eelgrass is great mulch and compost material as well. Um, and yes, you will never run out of it, I think, if you lived uh, in Cold Bay. There is kind of an endless supply there. Um, so this was sunset right before the storm moved back in, um, looking out over Eisenbeck Lagoon. And um, we're going to go on to the next refuge. So a little bit of a season change. Um, this is a refuge that I visited um, last March. And uh, my trivia question for this one is, um, this is just north of the White Mountains, outside of Fairbanks and south of Arctic Refuge. And the Yukon River runs through the middle of it. Um, so I wanted to see if anybody has a thought on which refuge this might be. It's also known as the Duck Factory of America because of the uh, incredible wetlands uh, that it features and it supports all kinds of waterfowl. Close, Yukon Charlie, which I think is a national park. It does have Yukon in the name. Yukon Flats, yeah. <laughs> so Yukon Flats, I was out there for um, just a few days in March. And, um, and I was out there uh, to cover a biology project, um, but I did get a few photos just of landscape. So this was, this was the same morning, the sun was coming up and the moon was setting. Um, so one direction you, you turned and you could see the sun coming up over the frozen lake and the other would be the, uh, the moon behind me. And Tracy, you would totally be cheating if you answered. Um, Tracy used to work for Fish and Wildlife Service as a refuge supervisor, so she knows these refuges like the back of her hand, I suppose. Um, so like I said, I was out there to, um, to do some story work with a group of biologists who were trapping and collaring lynx as part of a larger landscape level project, um, looking at how lynx move about the landscape and their relationship to um, snowshoe hare populations that go on a boom bust cycle. Um, so I, I was actually there in March when it was, it was getting warmer. It was not quite the Arctic temperatures I was expecting, um, but the crew there had been out for, um, for several weeks and they of course had all of their Arctic gear. So I had them put all of it on for me just so we could do a photo shoot and I could see, well, if we were there when the temperatures really dropped, what would they be geared up to wear? So this is their full outfit uh, with all of their warm layers on. And um, I'm sure they were sweating like crazy <laughs> for this photo. Um, but as I rode around with them, we went on their trap line um, to uh, check the different traps for lynx. Um, so they basically have these, these live traps. They bait them with a little bit of tasty um, waterfowl and some extra lures and, um, and hope to capture a lynx. Um, each trap does have a little radio signal on it and um, they can listen in so they know when the trap door has gone closed. And sometimes it's just a the door closes with nothing in it. Um, but regardless, whenever they get that signal, they'll go out and check the trap. And um, I was lucky enough to be there when they did capture uh, a few of the links. Um, so they were going through a process. If they did capture one, they sedated the links, um, they brought it out of the trap, and then they did um, kind of a full biological workup on the animal just to take the measurements to figure out how healthy it was, and then um, to put a radio collar, GPS collar. Uh, on it so that they can track its movements um, as it moves around the state. And they've seen some pretty incredible results from um, this project. They had one uh, lynx that went 400 uh, miles into Canada and, uh, and then you know, tracked back down through the United States. And um, so they're really learning quite a bit about um, how these animals are moving in relationship to when or when they don't have access to snowshoe hair. So of course, because I was able to be there with a captive animal, I was able to get some pretty close up shots that I would never have been able to get in a, in a different scenario. Um, this is one of the captive links, right? As he was uh, being released. Um, and this is a photo I took of, of a release of a lynx as it uh, was going back into the boreal forest. And normally when I'm photographing wildlife, I, I always like to try and get the eyes. And that's always been my focus is to try and get the eyes. And if I can't get anything else in focus, at least I've got 
you know, the face and the eye of the, of the animal. Um, and this is one of the few that I've liked where you're just seeing the hind end. <laughs> and part of it, I think, is it's a, it's a unique view of um, those huge giant snowshoe paws uh, that help the lynx just balance on the snow. And I can tell you, I was wallowing up to my hips in snow and, um, and this lynx just kind of effortlessly padded across and, and didn't sink at all. So, um, so I really had fun with this shot, just getting the, the different perspective. And I see I've got a couple questions here. Oh, how much does a lynx weigh? Shoot. That's a great question. And I don't know. I feel like it's around 25 to 30 pounds. But if somebody else has better understanding, please, please weigh in. I, I knew at one point when I was actually, you know, working on this story, but I, I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, All right, so that's the end of my, my short, brief stint at Yukon Flats. Um, and we're gonna go to a different refuge. Um, this one has just a few photos, but I definitely wanted to include it. Um, so this is one of the largest deltas in the world. And it's about the size, the delta is about the size of Louisiana. So which, which wildlife refuge would you guess that one would be? It's another refuge with Yukon in the name and <laughs> Yukon Kuskokwim. I know it's no fair not to have the map in front of you. Uh, it's the, the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge. So we have two different refuges with the name Yukon in them. One is Yukon Flats, uh, which is more in the, the center of the state, just above Fairbanks. And the other is Yukon Delta, which is over clear on the Western uh, side. Oh, thank you, Dave, for looking that up. Yes, a lynx weighs between 18 and 30 pounds. So I wasn't that far off. Um, I did get to hold one while it was sedated, and I wanted to say it's a, it felt hefty. It was a, it was a big cat, um, but not more than 30 pounds. Um, all right, so journeying back, back over to the west side of Alaska um, to the Yukon Delta Refuge, which is the second largest refuge in Alaska. Um, at about 19 million acres. Um, it does cover the Kuskokwim and the Yukon River Delta area. And um, really the main reason that I was there was to cover some stories around um, salmon management and conservation. Most of what I was doing at that point was um, with video work. So I really didn't take um, too many still photographs, but uh, this was inside of a, a smokehouse um, along the Kuskokwim River. I was really excited to be able to visit. So just a little tribute to, um, to sockeye salmon and the, um, the importance of salmon in this area. Importance of salmon to all of us in Alaska. Um, as part of that story, I was um, really showcasing the importance of our refuge information technicians. So this is, uh, this is Chris Tulick. He's from the Yukon River area, um, the Kuskokwim River area actually. And um, he does a phenomenal job working with people um, throughout all of the tribal villages along the rivers um, and kind of interfacing. He's, he does a lot of translation between Yupik and English. Um, he works on communication projects and really um, a lot of outreach work with folks in the region, um, helping our staff um, talk about what it is we're doing and, and how everybody can be part of that and help. Um, so that was, that was kind of the main gist of the project I was working on at that time. And, um, I had fun with this photo just because I kept catching the reflection of the Kuskokwim River in his um, sunglasses. And I really kind of enjoyed that. Um, and also profiling some of the work of um, folks who are working on the Kweethlik Weir, which is a little tributary um, into the Kuskokwim River. And so that's one of the, one of the salmon weirs that we operate um, in cooperation with people from uh, Kweethluck Village. All right, I'm gonna move on to my next refuge. Um, this is a totally different part of Alaska. And uh, my trivia question for this one is, this island was the site of the only land battle fought on North American soil in World War II which is appropriate since we're commemorating Veterans Day tomorrow. 
Atu. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Has anybody here been out to Atu? I know it's it's um, it's kind of a a mega pilgrimage area for people who want to get um, kind of rare birds or have a chance to see some of the birds that that get blown over from um, from the far east. Oh, Beth, your dad flew over there. That is so cool. Um, so I was not there during the main migration time. So I wasn't there on a birding trip or to get photos of birds. Um, I was there for a, a very different purpose. Um, I was there with refuge staff who were um, starting to prepare for the 75th commemoration of the Battle of Attu, which, uh, which we commemorated in 2018. So this was a 2017 trip. And again, I was doing a lot of video work, um, but here are a few photos. Um, from, from the island. And this is part of the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. So Atu um, is the island that's the furthest out on the Aleutian chain. Um, and we flew to Adak and then we boarded uh, the research vessel for the refuge and it took us another 58 hours uh, to sail out from Adak to reach Atu. So um, it was definitely a, a trip to get out there. Um, this is the beach at Massacre Bay. So this is the uh, this is the area where U.S. troops came ashore on May 11th, um, 1943, and they were coming ashore this island to um, to reclaim it from Japanese occupation. So the Japanese had um, had invaded the island, uh, taken the Aleut village, the Anunga people there, uh, prisoners of war, and um, had basically claimed the island of Atu and Kiska. And so this was the this was the place where US troops landed to, um, to take it back. One of the places, there were two places. Um, the other place was on the other side of the island and this, this area is known as Jarman Pass. So this was kind of the area where um, the US forces came over the pass and the two forces met um, to try and, and um, meet the Japanese forces where they were. And Marion, I remember that. I remembered Marty. I remember, so Marion's husband, Marty, uh, his dad fought at Atu in World War II. Um, pretty amazing. Still alive at 95. Um, so this is the site of the final uh, Battle of Atu. And it was uh, took place on Engineer Hill, um, May 29th. And this was, the, this was what ended the Battle of Atu. Um, and so this is still a, a memorial site and um, lots of the, the relics of war are still here. Um, but it is also a place that's recovering from, um, from that war. There's been a lot of uh, recovery work done and, um, and just a, a, a pretty amazing history on this island. So this is a um, photo of the peace memorial. This was erected by the, um, by the Japanese um, with a message of peace inscribed on it. And this photo was taken from within one of the foxholes that was on Engineer Hill. This is placed at the top of Engineer Hill. Um, and I crawled inside to, to get this photo. All right, we're gonna move on from a different island. So this is, this was, um, this is one of the Aleutian Islands we passed on our way back in. And so I'm using it as a transition slide to go to a different part of Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and my trivia question for this one is, this is a, um, uh, this bird, it nests only on four island groups in the world. Um, and these are the Pribilofs, Bogoshoff, and Baldir Islands. Um, yes, <laughs> Lisa's got it, it's the red-legged kittiwake. Um, so you're probably more familiar with its cousin, the, the black-legged kittiwake. And this one um, is a pretty special little bird and it's got legs that are just kind of this bright red neon Cheeto color. Um, and it takes us to the Pribilof Islands, which is uh, where most of the population um, breeds. So here's a few more photos from, from St. Paul Island, uh, Parakeet Auklet. And of course, a horned puffin. Um, the Pribilofs are, are pretty world renowned for being amazing um, seabird 
rookeries and colonies and um, and it's another birding hotspot within Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, has anybody here been out to, to St. Paul or St. George? Yes, Marion's been. So this was another one where I was, it's kind of the tragedy of my job is I'm, I'm usually only here on these locations for a couple of days at most. And, um, and it's a little bit different from being able to go to a place as a photographer because I'm usually there for a particular purpose. And so I, I don't get to spend all the time I want getting the photos I want. And I don't necessarily get to choose the, the weather or the lighting or, um, or how long I can spend getting a photo. Um, I'm usually following other people around and just kind of have to get the photos as I, as I can. Um, so I was only on St. Paul for about 36 hours and I, I desperately want to go back at some point. It looks like a few people have been out to the, to the Pribilofs. So red-faced cormorant. Um, but I wasn't there for the birds. I was actually there because of the fur seals. Um, and uh, the fur seals are a part of this story because um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually had uh, wildlife agents stationed out on St. Paul um, this was actually back before it was Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so in the, the early part of the 20th century, there were um, wildlife agents who were basically running a fur seal um, harvest. Um, and they had the Aleut people working for them, uh, running this fur, this commercial harvest of fur seals. Um, and when war broke out, when World War II broke out, um, within about six months, um, there were the, the ordered evacuations of people in the Aleutians and in the Pribilofs. Um, and so our Fish and Wildlife Service agents were part of the um, forced removal of people from St. Paul and St. George to internment camps um, in Southeast Alaska. And I'm gonna have to move. So I put some text on these slides um, just to get a little more context to this story. Um, so I was out there in 2017 um, for a commemoration ceremony and um, the people of St. Paul now do an annual commemoration on June 14th every year where they uh, remember the forced um, evacuation of their village. And so they walk down uh, the road from the baseball field where they were interrupted while playing baseball. Um, they were basically given one hour to pack what they could in a suitcase and, um, and walk down to the, uh, the harbor at the time to board onto a ship that would take them to Southeast Alaska. Um, and during this commemoration ceremony, our director from Fish and Wildlife Service uh, came out to um, at the invitation of the, the people of St. Paul and delivered a formal apology. Um, it always makes me teary, so I put words on the slide so I wouldn't have to speak during this part. Uh, because I can't, I can't imagine what this must have been like. Uh, but it was a very powerful ceremony to be there for. And um, and that was I, why I was there taking photographs. All right, we're gonna move on to one of my last refuges. Um, this one, I think probably many of you will recognize. It's the largest refuge in the United States uh, and is famous for all kinds of things. Um, and I feel like probably many of you have been to visit um, any questions or, I mean, any, any guesses on which refuge this would be? Yes, Lisa's got it. Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Um, how many folks have been up to Arctic? I'm just curious. The Marsh Fork, yes. So, um, so again, this is a, a refuge that I was really fortunate to visit. Um, and 
visited a, a specific place for a specific project. And um, it's a place I'd love to go back and see more of. It's just such a vast country. Um, I can't imagine that you ever really run out of places to, to see up here. Um, so this is a flight up and over the Brooks Range uh, because the project I was going to uh, be embedded with is up on the coastal plain at the very tippy top um, on the, the far um, northwest corner of the refuge along the, um, the edge of the Canning River. And this is just some of the scenery on the way up. Um, so I don't know, I'd love to hear from this group at some point, um, because I feel like the, the couple of times I've been able to get aerial photographs, um, I'm always kind of fighting with the, the dirty plane windows. And, um, you know, a couple of times I've had a pilot who's offered to fly back again to get scenery, but most often they're kind of going the A to B, you know, direct flight. And um, so you're just kind of snapping photos as, as fast as you can and trying to do the best you can with the situation. And um, so I'd love to hear folks if you have suggestions for, for working with that kind of challenging circumstance where it's um, you're seeing this amazing scenery, but you kind of have some, some less than ideal uh, shooting conditions for getting the, getting the photo. Um, both times I flew up here, unfortunately the plane I was in did not have windows that I could put down. So I was just kind of like pressed up against the glass, just so sad because of course you get reflections and you get dust particles and you get all kinds of scratched windows and uh, it's just, you know, someday my dream is to fly over Arctic Refuge and be able to roll the window down. Um, so up, up on the very top here on the ground, um, this is a um, definitely an open plane. Um, and so photographically, it's, I found it kind of a, a, a challenge to figure out how to bring into detail the really small pieces of this landscape because it, it can get so easily lost in how open, uh, open it all is. And I was up there um, really at the beginning of the summer, the snow had just melted. Some of it hadn't melted out in some places. And so it was really um, uh, just beginning to break into bloom. And <laughs> I see somebody has a good suggestion to wear black to help with reflections. That is a great suggestion. Uh, for Fish and Wildlife Service, unfortunately, we, um, we do follow some safety precautions and that includes wearing a bright orange vest with a with flotation um, if we're flying over water. And so it's, it's something I've battled with for, for years, how to not get that orange reflection in the glass. Um, ouch, yeah. <laughs> And I think I have some folks on the call who actually were based in this research camp. Um, I think I saw, saw a few folks in here. So this is at the, the Canning River Delta um, Bird Research Camp. This camp has been um, a temporary seasonal camp um, since the late 1970s. And it's primarily um, put in place to help study the bird populations that, um, that come up here to breed in the summertime. So it's one of the more remote field camps I've ever been to. And um, my hat is definitely off to the folks that live here for, um, you know, for several weeks at a time. I was only here for about a week. Um, and even in uh, midsummer, I was here over solstice. It was still um, 30 degrees and, and windy blowing 25 most of the time. And so <laughs> it was, it's definitely not, um, definitely not a warm summer getaway, but a pretty amazing place. Um, so part of what I was here to capture were the, um, the just the immense um, explosion of life that happens among all of the breeding birds out here on the coastal plain um, during the summertime. Um, these are red phalarope chicks and they're in a nest that's being monitored by biologists. Here's the red phalarope adult. Um, so fun fact about these guys that I learned is that um, in the wintertime, they don't really come inland at all. They're, they're always out at sea. And uh, if you look at their description, I forget which website it is, um, they listed as can often be found um, with whales. So they tend to associate, associate with whales um, when they're out and about in the wintertime. And in the summer, they breed up on the, the Arctic plains, coastal plains. Um, 
Another fun fact about phalaropes is that they switch gender roles in, during breeding. So the, the ladies are the ones that um, fight over the males and then they leave the males to incubate the eggs and they go off and they look for other mates, which is kind of a, a, different, um, a different setup than you normally find in the bird world. This is just a, a shot out over the wetlands on the plain. Um, again, just that really big open grass savanna. After flying over the Brooks Range, you don't really expect it. Um, but this is this is where all the birds come. Um, and part of that is the, the unique timing of the uh, mosquito hatch. So fortunately, I managed to be there just before the mosquitoes hatched out. I never had to deal with the, with the bugs. Um, but that is a big reason why the birds go up there. Um, to nest. And uh, the other reason is there's relatively few predators in this area. So it's a great place to have a nest and raise some baby, baby chicks. Uh, this is one of the other birds that we were setting um, up on the plane. This is a pectoral sandpiper. And um, these are just super cool birds. I had no idea. Normally you see sandpipers um, you know, running along in big groups out on the, the mud flats along the coast. Um, but up here on the coastal plain, they are um, grassland birds and they kind of spread out and disperse. And then they, they have these different mating displays. Um, the pectorals have this, they, they have that, that um, kind of drooping sac in their front because it's, a, it's actually an air sac that they can inflate. And they kind of almost do this hooting noise as they glide out over the tundra. Um, it, it really spooked me out the first time I heard it um, because you almost, you look around for almost like an owl, but, um, but it's the pectoral sandpiper. And <laughs> thank you. Tim, are you still on this call? I saw Tim Knudsen on this call and he, um, he's one of the crew leaders actually for the, uh, the research that is going on up here on the, um, on the coastal plains. So Tim, if you have anything you wanna pitch in, please feel free. I'm just gonna include this map. Um, part of the work that uh, folks have been doing up there is tagging, putting small little geolocators on these birds to find out more about where they're going, where they're stopping over, what are the different habitats that they need um, along the way on their migration. So these are tags from um, pectoral sandpipers so you can see their route. I really envy their winter plan. Um, they go all the way down to South America and um, and I sure wouldn't mind having this kind of a travel schedule. Um, the other thing I learned while I was up with this crew um, is that this, a lot of these birds, um, they, they really just kind of, once the chicks are hatched, they stay with them for a few weeks. And then uh, the parents bail out on their migratory path and the chicks um, will find their own way south a few weeks later. So they're really kind of out on their own um, pretty quickly. This little guy was um, probably just a few days old. So this is a, a pectoral sandpiper chick. And um, this was one of the great challenges of trying to photograph these birds for me was um, trying to, first of all, see them running around in the grass and then actually figure out how I could get down on their level and uh, get a photo of them. They're quite quick. Um, they're quite difficult to photograph. And, and this was probably one out of, I don't know, 700 that maybe, <laughs> you know, actually turned out. Um, I got a lot of really terrible uh, attempts at, at the, uh, the little chicks. And with that, I'm gonna give a short plug because this week we are actually celebrating uh, the Arctic uh, birds. And um, part of the reason that I was up there for the last couple of years was to help get footage for the Arctic Virtual Bird Fest. Um, I know most of you are probably familiar with other in-person bird festivals like the Kachemek Bay Bird Fest. Um, we can't bring you all up to the coastal plain, but what we do try and, and provide um, are some some photos, some footage, some fun quizzes and events um, to create a virtual bird fest. And it's all online and you can participate this week. Um, you can go to the, the website there, arcticbirdfest.com, or you can go to any of our social media platforms, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service Alaska, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the national uh, Facebook or Instagram accounts, um, all are hosting this this week. And there's a different prompt and theme for each week or each day. Um, I think tomorrow is post a duck. So if you've got duck photos that you just love that you've been holding on to, you want to join in and participate. 
Um, I know they're going to be asking for folks to join in. I think Friday is post post bad bird photo. So um, any of those 700 photos that didn't turn out that you want to share, um, I think they're looking for, for folks to just jump in and participate. So um, hopefully you can enjoy some of the things that we've got lined up this year. Um, since we did uh, have most of our field work canceled due to COVID. Um, we're doing a lot more work this year with trying to connect with lower 48 refuges. So some of our urban refuges where these birds stop over on their way um, down south and, and just really um, get more participation from folks who might be seeing the different work birds that migrate between um, the Arctic and, and your own backyard. I think so, Marian. This is actually not my photo. This is the, the website photo. Um, so I don't know for this one. <laughs> Kathy Doty, I have some bad bird photos. I have, I don't know about you all, but I have way more bad bird photos than I have good bird photos. <laughs> um, so I also had a chance while I was up uh, up at this camp to jump over to another field project. And um, this was a, a field project that's been running for a few years to look at common eiders. Um, common eiders are a really great indicator species for the, um, the coastal areas. So they can kind of help us tell more about how other species, other birds are doing um, that nest in this similar area. Um, and they're a pretty interesting bird. I'm, just, I'm trying to follow the chat too. Um, they nest all along these driftwood rack lines um, on the barrier islands that are actually north of Arctic Refuge that are out in the Beaufort Sea. Um, so you can see here's just a little bit of a, a shot of all the, the female eiders um, just kind of nesting close together uh, along the, the rack line of this driftwood. And uh, the team was studying these birds um, partly because you can see from this photo, these barrier islands are just strips of gravel um, that are just not very high above the level of the ocean. Um, and with a change in climate, we're seeing more storm surges, we're seeing less sea ice that protects these islands. Um, so there's some concern that with the way that these birds nest um, in these particular areas, that their, um, their nests might not, their nests might be impacted uh, by climate change. Um, so one of the challenges for me in trying to tell the story of this project um, photographically was that this is a pretty flat um, landscape with not a lot of characteristics to it. And the best I could do really was turn it into black and white. And so, um, so any thoughts on that? I'm, I welcome feedback. Um, in color, these photos don't really pop out as much, but um, I was able to get them to pop a little bit more. With, um, with the black and white. So here's just a few of those. Um, this one, you can almost see uh, the, the sea ice in the background, um, the, that bit of mirage that's happening that makes it look like it's quite a bit higher than it really is. Um, so that's on the other side of this barrier island. And I think I can see a few dust specks that I didn't remove in this photo, so oops. <laughs> um, th thanks for the folks that are liking the, the black and whites. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to my last refuge. Um, this one, of course, is, is my favorite one. I'm a little biased. Um, Kodiak Refuge is, is not accessible to the town of Kodiak, so it's not like I got to spend um, a ton of time out there, um, but I did get to visit um, at least once or twice each summer um, as part of my job. And so these are gonna be a few closing photos um, from my time out there. All right. Um, so Kodiak of course is famous for, um, for its brown bears, which are a distinct subspecies of coastal brown bear. Um, this was a pretty unique scene. I've um, not really been able to repeat this one, but I really liked how all of the bears together in this kind of seemed like a, almost like a, I keep thinking of like a Renaissance painting of still, you know, kind of still motion. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the painting, but I don't have it in mind. So if anybody else comes up with it, um, 
let me know. Oh, and thanks, Tim. So Tim put in a link to um, a presentation that he's giving next week on Arctic Refuge. So if you want to learn more about um, about the work that he's been doing up there, thank you so much for remembering to do that, Tim. <laughs> I completely forgot to give that link in. Um, he'll have a lot more information about all of that work. Um, okay, back to bears. Um, I have a lot of bad bear photos and I have a couple of good bear photos and I have quite a few favorites. And so I'm not gonna share them all, but I'm gonna share just a few, the, the ones that I've really um, enjoyed. This one is just um, a lucky positioning of a bear that was charging at some salmon. And uh, I like how it's um, kind of looks like it's coming directly at you and coming directly out of the screen. Um, of course, I was not in, in any way um, lined up with where this bear was headed, but just kind of a, a lucky angle. Um, so one of the areas where I spent some time within the refuge is uh, a bear viewing location called Fraser Bear Viewing, Fraser Pass, Fish Pass. Um, and if anybody's been out there, I think, I think Tim's probably been there. I think Marion's probably been there. Um, this is one of the few locations where you can fly down and spend uh, part of the day or all day on a bear viewing uh, trip and bear photography trip. Um, so it is one of the one of the places in the refuge that's easiest to access and the, the bears that are in this area are um, fairly habituated to human presence, um, hopefully not in a, in a negative way or a positive way, just in a neutral way. So um, this works kind of in a similar way that um, other bear viewing locations like Katmai or McNeil work. Um, where the bears are used to your presence. Um, in this location, we, we just have people sit in one place uh, in a bear viewing location instead of being able to, to walk around, um, which might be your experience if you've gone to Katmai. Um, but one thing that I think is super unique about Fraser is that just by sitting there, you get to observe so much different bear behavior and especially um, mother bears with cubs. So this is a um, this is a location where you will almost always see family groups of bears, which is pretty special. Um, so here's some, a couple of my favorite cub photos. Um, these are, of course, cubs of the year, the koi. Um, so these guys would have been born in their dens in uh, January or February, and this would have been their first summer. Um, they're probably only about 30 pounds at this point, and then they, they continue to gain weight throughout the summer. Um, they get up to all kinds of hijinks. They do a lot of wrestling practice, a lot of um, playing around with each other if they've got siblings. Um, two or three bear cubs in a litter is pretty normal. So a lot of these groups um, had, had at least one other sibling to play around with. A couple of times when you see just one bear cub, um, the bear cub ends up playing a lot with its mom. So its, its mom can help develop those skills, those social skills that it's gonna need um, later in life. This little guy is the run of the litter that I was looking at. And he got a lot of special attention from mom because um, his siblings were always playing with each other and they kind of left him out a lot. And so his mom would, would bat him around and, and play with him and wrestle with him. And um, one of the other special things about this area is that you can go back year after year and you can often see the same family groups. So you can essentially watch them grow up um, so this is the same bear cub and mom one year later, uh, actually 13 months later. And I, I knew it was the same because the mother has a very distinctive scar on her hip. Um, and they, they played in a very similar way. And it just seemed like you could, you could watch their development from the previous year, but you can also see how much that cub grew um, just within 13 months. Um, of course, it's not just bears. There are other... Um, other charismatic mammals on Kodiak, um, because it's an island, there's only six mammals that are considered native to the island. So brown bears are one of those. Um, the red fox is another. And Kathy's asking, what time of year did I go? So the peak time to go, if you wanna go to Fraser for bear viewing, um, I would recommend mid-July to early August. Um, but it's one of those things that can change from year to year and a lot of it is dependent on the salmon run. So that is a, that's a sockeye salmon run and the presence of the bears, the, the concentration of the bears, I should say, around that area are gonna be during the, the peak salmon migration. So 
Um, so it's always a good idea to kind of check in and see what the salmon run is doing. Um, yeah, thank you. This was a fun, this was a, a fun fox to, to hang out with for a little bit. Um, also ermine, um, that's another one of our native mammals in Kodiak. Um, they're always so fast, it's really hard for me to get pictures of them. Um, but this was one that, that I happened to get while it was holding still for just a, a second. Um, of course, we also have a, a large population of bald eagles and um, January is actually one of the better times if you're going down to Kodiak uh, for photographing bald eagles. Um, we get a lot of eagles from the Kenai Peninsula actually that come down in the winter um, to take advantage of Kodiak's waters. Um, so if you're looking for a large concentration of eagles, I can definitely recommend January and February. And Kodiak also uh, gets a pretty special visitor in the winter time. So this is, uh, this is an emperor goose and we call it Alaska's goose because it only um, breeds and winters within um, Alaska and a, a small, I think, slice of Siberia. Um, so most of this population breeds up on the Yukon Delta Refuge and then winters um, on Eisenbeck and the Aleutian Islands and Kodiak. Um, so another really great winter opportunity if you're going down to Kodiak. Um, and Mary, and I've been seeing a lot of photos from folks of the, the geese. So it looks like there's some, some good, um, good opportunities already happening down there. They're one of my favorite birds to photograph. I just think they're so incredibly beautiful and, um, and just have a really unique look to them. Um, we also have some fun opportunities just around town to, to get um, some neat photos of otters and Marion will recognize this is this is an otter that was hanging out in the harbor downtown and um, he actually floated right underneath. I was kind of walking down the rampway down to the, the boat floats and uh, and he just kind of came floating right, right underneath. So I was able to, to just aim directly down and get the shot, um, which is kind of a unique um, shot. I've never been able to get anything like this before. Um, but just happened to luck out as he was floating by. Uh, but Kodiak is definitely a, a, a hot otter spot. Um, they're doing quite well around the archipelago. Um, and I think that may be my last slide. Uh, yeah, all right. So that's all I have for tonight's show. And um, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to chat more or just happy to connect with folks um, afterwards. I'd love to learn more about photo the photography opportunities here in Anchorage and, um, and around now being on the road system. It's kind of a, a unique thing for me. And, um, and if any of you are going out to wildlife refuges or have photos that you've taken on refuges that you're interested in sharing with us at any point, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. We can always use um, great wildlife photography. I can I can usually attribute it. Um, I just can't post anything that has a watermark or I can't give a, a photography business credit, but I can absolutely give a photographer credit. Um, we're always looking for photographs that we can use on our social media platforms um, to share all of the great places and wildlife um, that we have here in Alaska. So um, we'd love to hear from anybody who does photography regularly out on wildlife refuges. Um, it'd be great to connect with you. And with that, I will turn it over uh, for the next section, which I think is um, member slides. Is that right? Um, does anybody have yep. questions first? Just, you can jump in if you have questions. Otherwise, Alan, can you get the slides prepped, please? Okay. They're ready to go, Margaret. Um, awesome. Just got to share my screen is all when we're ready. Well, why don't you go if you're ready, Alan? Uh, basically, we have four people up. We have Bart Quimby, followed by Bill Rome, Kathy Hart, and uh, Marvin Falk. Are they, are they all present that they can come yeah, online? Yeah, Bart's with? here. Yeah, OK. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, here. I'll, uh, yep. 
So as you you see your image come on up, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and talk about your slide. And I will share my screen here. And I'm gonna share the big screen, I think, um, if I can. Because I noticed that uh, some people's slides were a little uh, missized here. So let's see, screen two, there we go. Hi, Nikki. See how this goes. I haven't done this before, so we'll see how it works. Can everybody see the uh, yep. bird picture? Right. Arts bird picture, can you see that? Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. Great. So this was a uh, loon taking off at um, what's the next one? Uh, no. We went with an eagle. Oh, beach. Beach Lake. Yeah. Okay. So we went out a couple of mornings with uh, to uh, to see what was going on this summer with uh, loons. Let us get real close and. Eventually, after about a couple hours, they took off on us. And this guy took off without any warning whatsoever that I noticed, but I just happened to have my camera pointing in, in the right direction. So, next. Uh, a couple of my sons and I did a, a trip up off the Denali Highway to go find a caribou and the, at the height of the fall colors, they didn't come out that well in this picture here, but it was not, it was a non-motorized area. So this is kind of how we got around. Next, but this, this is the valley that we were in and uh, you know, there were a lot of caribou up there. So it was easy to get one, but the, um, the uh the scenery was incredible though next so i've been trying to get uh, a pleasing picture of beluga whales um uh, seems to be kind of hard to do but uh we were out one evening at beluga point and they were out and the sun was low and so we got a few of them anyways next So this is Fire Lake. Uh, fall colors this year, I don't know the fact that I got out more to look at them, but they just seemed extra incredible this year. Um, so a few airplanes makes every picture better, I guess. Next. So same place, uh, but on a foggy morning, you can see the airplanes in the background. Um, I just like the reflections and the leaves in the water around this little floating island. Next. So I went out to take some northern light pictures on a low probability night up uh, that I figured what I needed to do was find a location that had other than northern lights to do. This is actually out at Mirror Lake parking lot and that's a light on the Glen Highway. Um, but I really liked the way it was lighting up the trees. Next. This is another night where um, there was a forecast for northern lights and the hole in the clouds was at the end of a Klutna Lake. So I rode my bike out to the end of the lake and uh, two of my sons and three of my grandchildren showed up uh, in, in the evening. And uh, so my uh, bivy sack on the left is where I was sleeping with my camera on a tripod right next to my bed and I would wake up uh, about every 45 minutes to an hour and look for, see if I could see stars. And then eventually I was rewarded with some Northern lights, but I didn't even have to get out of my sleeping bag to take their pictures, which is great. It was kind of chilly. <laughs> Next, uh, we were out at Jim Lake and we heard that there were over a hundred swans out there. So we took our canoe and went out and uh, one of my sons showed up and decided to do some duck hunting. So he put out decoys of ducks and swans. These three swans came over to have a chat with the decoys. And uh, after about 10 minutes, they were somewhat disgusted with the lack of response from the decoys and then swam away. Next. And now uh, it's getting to be freeze up. So this is a, a creek coming down out of Ram Valley up uh, Eagle River Valley. And uh, I've been trying for 
several years to figure out a good way to take pictures of frozen streams and I've never been pleased with the results but decided that maybe more intimate shots are better so this is one of them and I think that might be the last of my shots yep yep Bill Rom you're up okay yeah this is uh can people hear me yep yeah okay this is a picture of uh, Harvard Glacier and I'm on board my boat and it looks like a uh, a real slow uh, shutter speed, but actually that's real, real time uh, movement of, of those clouds. That's uh, something you just don't normally see. Next. Okay, uh, this is from Mal Post uh, 112 on uh, the Glen Highway, uh, looking south over the, to the Chukach uh, mountain range. Next. And this is about, oh, I'd say 15 miles out of Cantwell on the Denali Highway. That's the very first uh, snow this past, uh, this fall uh, on the mountains. And uh, this is uh, Chenega Glacier down in Prince William Sound. And uh, about five or six years ago, uh, this thing, this glacier was in the water, and now it's like 90% uh, out of the water. Just absolutely unbelievable. I'm documenting all the glaciers out there, how these are all retreating. Just unbelievable. Next. And Kathy, you're up. Kathy, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. So um, I had an opportunity to go to Utah this year. Um, a friend of mine was suffering lung cancer and had been stuck in her house with COVID for eight months and was really depressed. So Eric and I rented a big old RV and snagged her up and took her and we just played in the national parks. So this is my first trip to Utah doing this. So this is Arches. We did the whirlwind trip. Next. This is um, one of the arches that we hiked up to. There were so many people there. There was no way that I was gonna get a picture without people in it. Um, but I, I like the people in it just because it adds a sense of scale. Next. This is also at Arches. We were wait, trying to find the perfect place to shoot a sunset. And um, this little area that we went to, do you remember the name, Eric? Eric. Uh, next. And then this was on our way to uh, Newspaper Rock. And I just liked the tree, the simplicity of the tree with the red rocks behind it. Next slide. And this was also on the way to Red Rocks. It was so nice to see yellow trees again and blue sky. And I just like the simplicity of this image. Next. Just another picture in the same area. Next. This is newspaper rock or a piece of it. It was really fascinating. Next. Same location. Next. Um, this was on the way to Newspaper Rock and I just fell in love with this cottonwood tree. I just thought it was absolutely stunning. And I could have spent the entire day just photographing this tree, I think. Next. This is the Colorado River. We were looking for places to, to shoot sunsets. And so we came across this spot and set up the camper and cooked dinner and waited for the sun to set. So this is just one of the pictures before the sunset. Next. This was the view from the other direction. Next. And this is a view from a different direction. I just love the color of the rocks. 
Um, next. This is Red Rock Country, or Red Rock Canyon, I think is what they call this. Next. This is, I forget, but somebody that's, that's online just got back from there. I think they spent a whole week there. Lynn, where did you say that you were? Right, that's Capitol Reef, Kathy. Yeah, this is Capitol Reef. It was absolutely beautiful there. Next. This was just driving through Capitol Reef. I just thought the scenery was absolutely gorgeous. And I liked having the road in it to show you what you were actually seeing while you were on the highway. Next. More parts of Capitol Reef. I tried to get pictures whenever I had the opportunity that has yellow flowers in it. And I liked this one because, and again, it's the road that you can see that it just goes on and on through this beautiful area. Next. And this is Bryce Canyon. I had never been to Bryce Canyon before and found it uh, challenging and loved it. Um, next. This is also Bryce. I think the rest of the pictures I have are of Bryce. Um, next. Everywhere you look, there was different angles and different lighting on the um, on the spears. Next. Now we're getting into sunset. Next. And that's and not Marvin, you're up. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been working on uh, eagles for at least 15 years, uh, off and on, as I could have a, a chance. And uh, what I've one thing that I'm working on right now is to um, uh, see if I can reflect uh, some human attributes to these some of these birds. Um, they definitely have uh, individual personalities. And um, I'm trying to uh, elicit that. Um, uh, this is an anchor point, but it's kind of uh, evocative, evocative of, of uh, the uh, uh, habitat. Uh, next. This one uh, uh, looks different because of he's coming right at you. Um, but again, um, they look like different birds depending on, on the uh, uh, angle that you use. Uh, next. And of course, they're very uh, uh, into uh, salmon. This is on the Chilkat uh, River. Uh, good. And um, they, uh, it's always interesting how they interact with each other, um, often in close uh, uh, proximity. Um, and I'm trying to capture a little bit of that. Uh, next. Uh, this is all in uh, Kachemak Bay. Uh, next. And you, you can... <laughs> That's you can ascribe point. all kinds of personal uh, uh, attitude here. Uh, next. They're scrapping forever. Um, no one seems to get hurt very often, but um, they're very uh, combative. Uh, but then they can uh, uh, congregate in, in you know, 20 or 30 uh, eagles at a time, um, and everything is absolutely uh, uh, peaceful uh, until something else breaks out. Uh, next. And uh, I think this uh, uh, depicts a, a common situation where uh, all of a sudden something happens and uh, it's a surprise. Um, next. This guy, um, I have um, uh, he's a, he looks a little different than most uh, eagles, um, and I follow him around. Um, uh, I must have, I don't know, 40 or 50 pictures of him um, doing different things, uh, fishing, uh, flying, uh, doing all kinds of things in the air. Um, 
and I, I'm trying to uh, then uh, contrast him with, uh, uh, I assume it's a him. I don't know how to tell the difference actually. Um, uh, but uh, uh, looking at other types uh, of uh, facial features and so on, this is uh, ascribing human um, uh, interpretation. It's not a scientific uh, 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 work at all. Next. And sometimes they go stalking off. Well, you're on mute again, aren't you? Yeah. Yep, so, that's the uh, that's the last I image, by the way. Yep. So anyway, I'm I'm still working on that. And I one thing I have that I didn't want to show here because I only had ten pictures, but um, I've got uh, uh, headshots of uh, many uh, eagles, and they're they're really quite different in detail. Um, and um, I'm tr I'm uh, trying to uh, uh, build some uh, uh, galleries of uh, of all these uh, different uh, headshots. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that I'm I'm working on right now. Okay. All right. Thank you all for those images. Um. Did anybody come up with questions for Lisa while we were watching this? Something you thought, oh, I should have asked that. You know, I had a question for Kathy. Uh, there was one image that she had that uh, uh, looked like there was like a reflection or water in it. It almost, it, it was like rocks in the background, but it almost looked like there was maybe a, a pond or reflection there of water. I wasn't sure if there was or not. Don't know. Okay, well, I don't have anything else for tonight. I will take as many of those links as I can that were in the presentation and post them, maybe send them out to everybody in case you didn't catch them while we were here. Um, so you can participate in the bird fest and all the, uh, the link that Tim put up, I've got that too. Uh, this was recorded. We will try to get it up on the website shortly. Well, it's recording to the cloud and we'll see how that goes. We haven't tried this way before. And otherwise, we'll see everybody next month. Um, mirrorless cameras will be our topic. <laughs>